for those of you who don't know me, my name is Emma Keenan. I'm the Deputy Director at the London University's Purchasing Consortium. And I'm absolutely delighted to be joined today by Simon Dawes, who is the Head of Sustainable Business Strategy at the Environment Agency. Uh, Simon and I met a few around carbon offsetting generally. Um, our conversation moved through the range of terminology and options and I realized how much I didn't know. So Simon has very kindly agreed to come today and share with you some of his vast amount of knowledge. Simon is going to present to you for about 20 minutes um, and then he's agreed to take your questions at the end. So if you pop your questions in the Q&A function and I will share those with him at the end of the presentation. And uh, without further ado, Simon, I will hand over to you to do your presentation. Brilliant. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for that um, <clears throat> kind introduction. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, as em Emma said, I'm Simon Dawes, Head of Sustainable Business Strategy for the Environment Agency. For those of you that don't know the Environment Agency, um, we are a non-departmental government body, so public sector. We're about a, a £1.3 billion organisation with uh, about 11,000 people. And in a nutshell, we're, we're the environmental regulator for uh, England, and we also build all of the country's flood defences and uh, provide a warning and informing uh, service uh, ar around that. And my role uh, within the Environment Agency is to try and uh, make us as, as sustainable uh, as possible. And for the last 18 months, I've had a pretty relentless focus on uh, net zero carbon, uh, and I guess that puts me in a a reasonable position to share uh, some of my uh, experience and talk to you about carbon offset today. Um, what I would say, just in advance, it, so here's my caveat, my health warning, um, this is not not going to be a definitive uh, masterclass, uh, and that's probably because, or certainly because, there is, there is no such thing. I think the world of carbon offsetting is one um, that is developing rapidly. It's it's quite immature. It feels like the Wild West, which um, is either quite disconcerting or or really energising. And I think I move between that spectrum uh, on a on a daily um, basis. Um, so what I'll run through with you is I, I just want to put carbon offsetting in the context uh, of, of net zero, um, and then we'll get into what what do we mean by carbon offsetting? How does it work? Uh, and how do those of you who are going to engage with it, what, what are the things you need to look out for and ask? And then we'll have uh, lots of room for questions after that. So um, I'm really lucky to have a chief executive who, uh, um, Emma, can I just check, does this, can, can you, this thing here that says, please just move this window away, is that on everybody's screen? Or? I can see it, it does fade out slightly, but um, I, I can, and see it. it's, it's gone again now but it does come back but your, your slides are there and, and I think if it's okay we're going to share your slides at the end of it so anything that it just covers yeah. up then we'll um we'll, it will be clearer afterwards well, okay I need to um let's find out how to make that disappear if anyone could give me any advice on that that would be most helpful but anyway I have um I'm lucky to benefit from a chief executive who loves a quote uh, and one of the quotes that he shares with us uh, within the organisation is from his time at Harvard Business School. And one of the things they teach you at Harvard Business School is that the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. And for us, the main thing is the climate emergency. Um, and, uh, and that really led us to um, our journey uh, around a net zero, of which offsetting uh, is, is one part. So we have a wider sustainability strategy called Emission 2030. Uh, and within that, there are some goals around climate. And, and, and that key goal, which our board signed off in 2019, was to be net zero by 2030. There are lots of different flavors of net zero, um, and you'll see all sorts of bold claims uh, in the press. Uh, and you'll see bold claims from your suppliers as well. And it's worth scratching the surface of that to see what they really mean. Um, one of the steers from our executive was that they wanted to do this in the most authentic way possible. Uh, and when I looked out there into the marketplace, the, the most authentic way of doing this was to align to a methodology called SBTI, so the Science-Based Target Initiative. And um, SBTI really provides you with a, a methodology or a framework for calculating what your share of emissions reduction needs to be in order to meet the Paris Agreements of trying to limit climate change to a one and a half degree warming scenario which is where we need to be uh, as a planet. 
So for us, that looked like we will we will reduce our emissions by 45 percent. And I'll come on to talk about this in a minute, but that's our total emissions. And then after that, we will deliver projects that lock up or sequester the remaining emissions. So the 55 percent that we're not able to reduce, uh, that's the bit that we will offset. Something that we've done, which quite a, a few others haven't, but will be required to, is Rishi Sunak announced next, uh, last week, uh, was to develop a plan, a roadmap for how we're going to get there. So there are lots of bold claims at the moment, um, but not all of them are backed up uh, with a plan. And for those of you that are aware of the uh, public uh, policy procurement note that's come out recently, any public sector contracts over five million pounds need to be uh, backed up with a, a carbon reduction plan. So that is a, a, a good thing. So uh, suppliers are going to have to have a similarly developed uh, roadmap of how they will get to uh, net zero carbon. Just to give you uh, a little bit of um, flavour, this is the Environment Agency's uh, carbon footprint. And we used to we used to really concentrate on the small circle on, on the right hand side, which um, was, was our buildings, our operational fuel, pumping water around, which is a really big deal for us. We have to shift water around when there's too much of it in the wrong place. So when there's a flood or when there's not enough of it in the right place, or when there's a drought, so we spend an awful lot of energy and then um, traveling around. And as you can see from that small circle, the, the lion's share of that was pumping. Um, but as you can see, if you look over to the large circle on the left hand side, when we started to look at all of our supply chain emissions, and we did a huge piece of work to understand what that looked like, we realized we'd only been concentrating for the best part of a decade on, on the small part of our footprint, on only 18% of our footprint, and actually 82% of our emissions lay in our supply chain. That's hugely dominated by construction activity. And that's partly a function of uh, we spend a lot of money on construction, so around about half a billion a year. Uh, and the type of activity it is, is quite carbon intense. So pouring lots of concrete, using lots of steel traditionally, although we're starting to move away from that to try and uh, improve our emissions, has had a really uh, big impact. So um, it's really important to us that we focus on that, that bigger uh, bit of the picture. So what did that plan look like for us? Well, um, it broke down into uh, four uh, areas, really. Um, concrete, because it was such a big deal, as I, as I just outlined. Um, cars, so our, our fleet, we've got quite a large fleet of cars. We've got around 4,000 company cars and about 1,800 vans and, and four-wheel drives to do our field work. Computers, so um, in each of the devices that we're all using now and, uh, and, and, and viewing this presentation on, there is quite a lot of embodied carbon and other precious metals wrapped up in those. And actually, um, I don't know whether this resonates with your organisations, but certainly for ours, there's a, if we're not careful, there's a prolif proliferation of devices. So you know, a laptop, an iPad, an iPhone. So actually, when we did that footprinting exercise, we realised computers uh, was a really big deal for us and also the associated uh, cloud computing uh, and networking that, that goes with that as well. And something that took quite a lot of people by surprise was our commuting uh, impact. So um, causing 11,000, pre-pandemic, I hasten to add, um, causing 11,000 people to shift around on a daily basis has quite a big impact. I, I don't think we realized quite how big it would be uh, we thought it would be significant, but not as significant as it was. So um, our plan looks to address all areas, but there's a big focus uh, on these four. Our plan has around 90 actions in it. Uh, there's direct action, so how do we reduce emissions from pumping? And then there's corporate enabling actions like HR and finance. So we're working with finance to set carbon budgets. We're working with HR to link uh, executive reward to those budgets. We've got a detailed uh, engagement plan for all of our staff. And I was just telling Emma before the call started how this week we've launched a climate and carbon literacy package to all 11,000 of our staff. I think we'd all recognise, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure I'm not alone in recognising the complexity of some of the language around this. 
So helping our people become carbon literate around it um, is going to help them really engage and see what they can do in their world. Importantly, all of the actions in that plan are owned by different directors in our business. And that's really, really important that it's, it's their plan, not the plan owned by me uh, and my team. The plan focuses primarily on reducing emissions. So that 45% that I referred to earlier, but there's a little chunk at the end that's all around offset uh, and, and what we're going to do to uh, absorb the residual emissions. So to get to the, get to the heart of what um, hopefully uh, you want to uh, hear about today. So what is offsetting? I, I've kind of alluded to this uh, already. An offset can be used to mitigate the residual or unavoidable emissions, but not to justify business as usual. Some people, or well, I say not, it can be, it shouldn't be used to justify business as usual. You'll have all seen that box you can tick when you jump on a plane that says, yep, I'll offset my emissions and it's an extra five pounds. That, that, that's not what we're, what we're about here. We're, and, and that's precisely why we've aligned to that SBTI methodology that requires us to make those deep cuts in emissions and then offset the bits that we haven't had time or technology isn't available to offset yet. Offsets can be either removals, so things that absorb CO2 from the atmosphere, think trees, very simplistically, or avoidance, so uh, avoiding additional emissions going into the atmosphere, think solar panels. So solar panels don't suck carbon out of the atmosphere, but they do avoid additional carbon going into the atmosphere. I, I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of different flavors of net zero uh, and uh, people will make various claims to you and will just say net zero. It, it's good to understand whether or not they're including uh, avoidance uh, in, in their definition of net zero or whether like us, they're focused solely on uh, removals, which is the most credible uh, and effective uh, way uh, of doing this. So how, how does offsetting work? Well, there are three broad uh, approaches. You could deliver offset projects yourself. It gives you complete control, but it's, it exposes you to some risk. It, it's more expensive, but it does allow you to align projects to your um, business objectives uh, and you can engage your staff around it. Now for the environment agency, that's absolutely the approach we want to take, but we're in a really fortuitous position. We've got about, 27,000 uh, hectares of land, which is quite a lot. Unfortunately, a lot of it's in quite long thin strips alongside riverbanks, which makes it practically impossible uh, to use, but we've, we've got other areas of land as well. And I appreciate not everybody's going to be uh, in that position, but also just a word here about scale. So if we were to make those really huge emissions reductions that we want to make, 45%, and then offset the residual, that gives us about 150,000 tonnes that we're looking to offset. If we wanted to offset that with tree planting, and a lot of people quickly default to tree planting when they think about offsets, we would need to plant more, and this is just for the environment agency, small, relatively small. Company. We would need to plant more trees than were planted in all of England, Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland put together last year. So about 10,000 acres. So for those of you that have seen Jeremy Clarkson's farm, just to put it in context, that, that, that series on Amazon, really, really big farm that um, Clarkson has there in the Cotswolds, that's about a thousand acres. So we, just for our little footprint, would need to plant 10 uh, of Clarkson's farms uh, in trees. So practically, that is a real challenge. And inevitably, what we are going to end up with is a bit of a blend uh, uh, of these things here, but we want to prioritize delivering projects on our own plan first. Your next option is to buy, uh, is to go to the marketplace and buy uh, domestic carbon offsets. Good thing with that, we're buying a UK verified product, we're keeping the benefits local uh, and, and within the UK. Uh, currently the supply of credits around that is pretty low and the price is expected to increase. And we're definitely expecting the price to increase at post COP. Similarly, price of land to be able to deliver offset schemes, we know already it, 
is going up. Uh, so there's some things to consider there in your strategy. But they are relatively cheap, those offsets. Um, so for, for UK um, based woodland or peatland codes, which are verified uh, codes, about 15 to 25 pounds a tonne. You could go to the international market, which um, will allow you to uh, pay money into schemes uh, that are delivering offsets in, in various parts of the world. Uh, and that's really that box that you tick on the, on the EasyJet form. Uh, and, and they're cheap. They're, they're really cheap. There, there's lots available. Um, and a lot of them are in places that will suffer the most from climate change uh, impact. Um, there's some question marks over it, though. The money leaves the UK, and there might be some challenges around that, depending on whether you're a public sector organisation. The quality is really variable, really, really variable, and there's some big question marks uh, over uh, whether or not they're valid claims. And the difficulty you've got, if you've paid money to a scheme in India, it's really hard for you to go and verify uh, that you're getting what, what you're paying for, essentially. So what do you need to ask? What, what makes a good offset? So there, there are some little tests that you can apply uh, to whether or not you're, you're getting a good product, product. First one's additionality. Would the project have happened without the money that you're putting into it? And if it would have happened without you putting the money in, then it's not additional. So it shouldn't count as an offset. Permanence, these, these are new things that I've learned relatively recently, permanence. It's really easy to think you've planted up or you've, you've paid into a project that's planted 50 acres of, of woodland. It's really easy to think that's it, job done, that's permanent. Those trees will absorb carbon over the next 100 years. What if a big storm comes along and wipes out 30% of the trees? Actually, you need to be careful then. You're not claiming credits for something that's no longer uh, there. The quality of projects really varies, as I was talking particularly about the international market, and the accuracy of reporting around the credits uh, really varies. And also on that point, uh, there are different verification standards uh, that are third parties apply to different products. So when you're looking to buy something, particularly if you're going down the international offset market, you need to be looking for good verification by third parties. And there are a few out there. So one called Gold Standard, there's one called Vera, uh, other ones are available. Uh, within the UK, we've got the Woodland Code and the Peatland Code, uh, and certainly Woodland Code and Peatland Code come with quite a high level of uh, credibility for them. Um, high quality uh, market offsets should meet all of those uh, criteria above, but I think a point to take away is you will need to do your own market research and you'll need to align to where your organization wants to be. I mentioned at the top of this that our executive are keen to do this in the most authentic way possible. Um, and I think we've seen a challenge in the marketplace in over the last few weeks and months around concerns around greenwashing. And if you're not careful, if you don't understand these tests and, and test the market, you could fall foul of uh, greenwashing claims. Uh, and, and really, uh, I guess this slide just uh, summarizes uh, some of those points. Um, I think one one just point on one thing I will just draw attention to is that, that last bullet point there. Different approaches can have different uh, multiple benefits. So, uh, for instance, uh, paying into a scheme that delivers household insulation, or, or, albeit that's carbon avoidance, um, you know, undoubtedly a good thing. But paying into a nature-based scheme that absorbs carbon out of the atmosphere, but also provides habitat helps slow the flow of water, which reduces flood risk, um, clearly delivers wider benefits than just the carbon. So there are things to uh, think about there too. And Helen, that's all I was, I was going to say. That's been a really quick whistle top, uh, whistle top, whistle stop tour of offsetting. As I said, it really is an emerging area, but um, I'm really happy to take uh, people's questions now, if that would be helpful. Thank you very much, Simon. That was really interesting. And I think um, you know, starting off like 
calling it the the wild west is quite interesting to think about what we're embarking upon as a new kind of area of, of understanding and expertise with things changing so quickly um if anybody has any questions do pop them in the chat i can see um things coming in here already um i think what i took what i took from that is the importance of that clear plan that you mentioned about people having ownership in an organization i'm interested in thinking about your supply base and i think you know with the public sector we are have um legislation we have guidance and we have pressure which we need to follow and that's not so much in the private sector just yet are you feeling seeing much pushback in that area are you seeing quite a lot of support in your supply base for this activity that's a, that's a great question actually i'd say we're seeing lots and lots of support um in fact i would go as far as to say some of our suppliers are wanting to go faster than perhaps we are ready to in in, in some areas mm. um which, which is which is really encouraging i think the the biggest challenge we have is that that thing around definition yeah. so some of our suppliers pitching up saying oh well we'll, we'll be net zero by 2025 we're great you know give more work our way but when we when we tap into it they their definition of net zero is quite different whereas what they mean is they're going to sign up to a green tariff by 2025 and we're like yeah Hang on, that feels a bit 1990. You know, we need we need a bit more than that actually, um, and that's why this needs some careful uh, engagement with supply chain. Certainly on construction, we take a really collaborative delivery approach with our supply chain, and that that's working really well. There's really good mutual learning on, on both sides, I think, across our framework there. So, but by and large, I'd say. Um, organizations are seeing this as something that will definitely help them win more work so they're wanting to be on board with it i just think it needs to be carefully caveated with scratch below the surface and, and look at what they're really playing that's great thank you and, and just on the construction somebody did mention earlier do you have some set questions that you ask for your construction suppliers and are they evolving um at the same kind of pace or uh so yeah we i mean we have a we've got a a six year framework for our uh, construction suppliers, which has been in existence for three years now. And, and there were um, there were some quite strict carbon assessment questions, uh, well, wider sustainability questions to get onto that framework. To be honest, I think now, if we were to relet it, we'd probably go harder on the carbon yeah. bits. But in the tendering of specific projects within the framework, yeah, we're asking them to look at how they can deliver low carbon solutions for okay. Uh, and that links into one of the questions, actually. Um, Pauline's asked, can you advise if you've managed to get your suppliers to advise what their carbon footprint is? And if so, how did you do it? Oh, yeah. Good. So good question. I mean, I, I hasten to add, by the way, I'm absolutely not a um, procurement uh, expert in, in any shape or form. Um, so one of our big challenges is getting really good quality data from our suppliers in, in a timely fashion and, and that's not to berate our suppliers it's more a reflection of the fact that if you're Kia for instance who are one of our suppliers we ask them for carbon data in at a certain way and at a certain time and then network rail asks them for slightly different carbon data at a certain time in a certain way and then HS2 asks them for some slightly different data and poor old Kia are just like oh we've got an army of people trying so there's something we're very conscious of on the client side of trying to bring some coordination and, and standardization to that. Um, but that notwithstanding, um, yeah, we, we're getting that they're, they're willing. I think the quality is quality is variable. Um, when we did that big footprinting exercise to understand what the, the bigger of the two pie charts look like, we'd done a piece of work a couple of years ago. We've got about 18,000 suppliers but we know the vast majority of the impact lies in the top 100 and actually the vast majority of that lies in the top 10. So I think we engaged, it was, I think we engaged directly. I can't, I'm trying to remember now whether it was our top 10 or our top 25, but we engaged directly with them and went to them with some very specific questions. We got a really good return from some, some kind of gave us slightly patchy return. And I think it comes back to that relationship point with them and also trying to make it as easy as possible for them uh, I think because that will improve the quality and the, and the time yeah. yes. 
Yeah. And I think we find the same, just that relationship with the supplier. And it's not a short term thing, is it's a long term oh, partnership really. discussion. So um, you mentioned the G word greenwashing um, a, a couple of slides back. And uh, Justin's asked, should we not be focusing all of our efforts on elimination reduction and no longer accept carbon offsetting as an acceptable alternative? Do you have any thoughts on that? hundred percent. Yeah. Um, in, in, in very, yeah, essentially you're right, Justin. And that's why I said we, we're aligned to that SBTI methodology though. The reality is, um, it's, so carbon offset should not be an alternative. Carbon offset should be used for when you are, you cannot, you've got some emissions left that you cannot reduce. So for instance, there is, the technology doesn't yet exist to be able to eliminate all of our emissions, for instance. Because we're including our entire supply chain, it, we, we would need to, we would need the entire global shipping um, industry to fully decarbonize for, to eliminate uh, our, our emissions. Um, so we are going to drive our emissions down as far and as quickly as we possibly can and we said at least 45%, but so that we can be confident that we're no longer contributing to climate change by 2030, that's why we're going to use offsets to uh, mop up the rest, essentially. So in essence, Justin, you're right, but there's an element of practicality around it, which uh, just means we wouldn't get to 100% reduction by 2030. Thank you. Um, and Michael's asked, he's conscious that climate change and biodiversity of ecosystems are closely linked. Um, uh, can uh, Martin used to work for British Waterways. Uh, can Simon advise actions the Environment Agency is taking to address methane release from agriculture and the runoff into rivers and watercourses? I'm not sure if that fits into today's or if it's a bigger, bigger question. So it is a, it is a big question, and it, and and at the risk of sounding like I'm co copying out, it's better suited to colleagues who work in in the regulatory yeah. space. But I know an awful lot of work has gone into and continues to go into the likes of the agriculture bill and and the environment bill. Because um, sorry, I've forgotten the name of the question. Is absolutely right. Those are really big sources of uh, emissions. Our chief exec gave a speech recently around climate adaptation, saying how what we were doing to, to adapt to the changing climate, because we know the climate is changing. And if we stopped emitting today, it would carry on changing for, for some time. The one thing that hasn't changed and needs to change is our regulation. To, and so we don't write the regulation. We enforce the regulations that we are given, but we try and influence them uh, in, a, in advance. So, uh, but I think that penny has dropped and um, the likes of the agriculture, uh, the reformed agriculture bill, are catching up with that, um, albeit maybe not as, as quickly as we would like. Okay, thank you. And um, someone's asked how you're calculating the impact of insetting, um, uh, i.e. the projects you do yourself, and if they're not verified externally, what metrics do you use? And I know we've not touched on insetting just yet, but is that uh, is that something you're doing familiar with yeah insetting is one of those terms i'll be honest it, it seems to have two different meanings mm. uh, a, a little bit some people mean um reductions for, by your suppliers and some might mean money that your suppliers are given to you and you collaboratively share on a project that you deliver on on, on your land and um, the question around how we're verifying things we do ourselves is, is a really good one so we are to an extent in a fortuitous position when we're building flood schemes the the nature of what we do tends to lend itself to habitat creation so typically on a on a coastal managed realignment um you know we we tend to end up creating quite deliberately um salt salt marsh um uh, at the moment there's no code in the uk that says and, and salt marsh will sequesters carbon there's no code in the uk verified code that says this is how much it absorbs um and this is how many credits uh, you can get for it and, and we're having a bit of a discussion internally at the moment i, I should should have said at the top we haven't completely worked out our offset strategy you know we're finding our way with this yeah um we uh we're having a debate internally at the moment around do we wait for a salt marsh code to become available, which might be three or four years down the line? 
or do we, and, and we're in discussions with policymakers about this, do we go about delivering that salt marsh work in a, in a way that will mean we might be able to retrospectively go back uh, and do it? So there are some standard things that any of the codes have around monitoring, verification uh, and reporting. So establishing a baseline, mm -hmm. going taking samples at fairly uh, regular intervals, and they're slightly different around the different codes and the salt marsh code will probably come out with its own. But if we've got a baseline, we can say what's additional, we can say what's permanent, we can say what's different, uh, and we've got you know um, monitoring data to back that up. Our intention is, or our thinking at the moment is, far better to take that approach, crack on now, than wait for four years for the code to come out and then start doing something. Mm -hmm. I think the only other slight caveat I'd add into that is the, verif the verified codes are really good for if you're looking to sell carbon credits or buy carbon credits. Our intention is not to enter the marketplace to be selling credits. Our intention is to lock up the carbon and, and leave it there. Thanks yeah. very much. I hope, I hope that answers the question. It's a, it's a great question. And it, it's just a good example of, a, of somewhere where we're finding our, our feet a little bit with it. Yeah, uh, that has answered the question, Olivia says. Um, you touched upon it earlier, actually, about the restrictions that we have with space, particularly in this country and how many trees we would need to plant. Um, so there's some questions around, you know, is there an answer to that? And obviously we're talking about international versus domestic um what can you expand a little bit on your thoughts around that i mean oh can you just solve the fact we have no more space and <laughs> yeah yeah on our, on our shrinking island the with list, more people yeah. On it. yeah we live on an ever decreasingly small island and decreasingly large island and there's more people on it um there's far bigger brains than me that um can tackle something like that and uh, and that's why we're going to need a complete blend of habitat types and we're going to need um, technology as well, like direct air capture um, of carbon dioxide. And, and, and that's one of those things that I thought, trees do that, trees capture carbon dioxide in there, they're great and they provide habitat and slow the flow. And yes, they do. The direct air capture, and it, you know, it's in the drawing board, well, just off the drawing board to say, they do it much, 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 much more quickly than, than trees, which is, uh, and we're gonna need, answers so we're going to need a complete blend of habitat types a complete blend of technology solutions and the reality is and, and this includes for us as well as well much as it might be really unpalatable to us we might have to look to other bits of the world where there is more space to uh, get offsets there but that provides a presents us with a real challenge about spending public money that is going abroad so we've had to take legal counsel advice on whether or not we as a public body even have the power to spend money in this way. Yeah. Um, and the advice that we got was, yes, we can. I mean, that, that's quite unique to us because we're created under the Environment Act, which set us up. Um, so we took some advice around that and, uh, and we can. What we got back was, we're likely to come under increasing challenge from the likes of the National Audit Office, the further away we stray from our core purpose. So planting trees that slow the flow, create habitat, um, absorb carbon, probably really sound. Spending money on cook stoves in India, probably likely to be a, exposed to public challenge around um, spending public money. And, and that's a really another really important point. And I think one of the reasons we started talking was I came across the academic paper, which talked about all the different types of carbon offsetting. And it was a whopping 17 different options, which I was amazed about, considering I was focusing particularly on trees. Um, is there kind of a, a, a place that people can go to see a reliable list of different options? Um, again, or is this still back into that Wild West territory that, that technology is advancing and that there's new things coming to the fore all the time? That is a great question. And I'd love to say that the answer is a, a very resounding yes, and here it is. But if there is, I'm not aware of it. And that's why we commissioned our research. And we've yeah. made that research publicly available to everyone. And, and, the, and the whole reason I'm speaking to you guys today is because, you know, we... Nobody wins on climate change. We either all win or we all lose. Yeah. Um, so we are sharing our journey um, in the hope that other people can leapfrog uh, a little bit some of the pitfalls that we might have uh, fallen down. 
Um, so when the when the question was asked around, you know, how we're dealing with verifying off work that we're doing on our own, um, that is just one of the examples of, of where we're, we're finding our feet. So um, Emma, maybe we can share afterwards the link to our we'll research yep. uh, that we did. And, and yeah, it is quite a weighty tone, but it's a really good one. But um, mm. yeah, it takes a little bit of reading. Yeah, super interesting. No, we'll share that with these slides and um, with the recording of this. Uh, so just a couple more questions, um, Simon. Does a verified standard in the UK exist for offsetting schemes that we could use to help purchase it offsetting where necessary? And I think you did pick up on a couple of things mm. in your presentation, but if you could just maybe just read re yeah, those. Yeah, there's, there's two really in the UK in terms, if you want to look at UK-based offsets. So there's the Woodland Carbon Code, uh, and there's the peatland carbon code. There's a subtle difference between the two. Woodland obviously absorbs CO2 from the atmosphere. Restoring peatland stops more carbon going into the atmosphere. So one is removals and one is avoidance. So under our SBTI methodology, which we've chosen to align to, um, in theory, we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be looking to peat. This is just for the Environment Agency. I'm not saying this is the case for anyone else necessarily but peat's really attractive to us because it provides all sorts of biodiversity benefits it slows the flow of water down which reduces flood risk so we're having a bit of a debate internally around actually for us should we deviate from that sbti methodology in order to allow us to use peat i know there are more habitat types coming mm -hmm. so um we're pushing quite hard on the salt marsh code because we create a lot of salt marsh so that um, I know the likes of Sky are pushing uh, quite hard on um, seagrass for a, for a code around um, seagrass. Um, but DEFRA and Bayes, who between them own the policy on this, uh, I know are looking at setting a framework for the development of codes and hopefully that will help accelerate more codes um, coming to market. But if you Google Woodland Carbon Code or Peatland uh, Carbon Code, you can see what you need to do to either um, comply with the standard or go to the marketplace and, and, and buy some codes with confidence, sorry, buy some credits with confidence. That's great. Thank you. And kind of linked to that actually is, have you experienced any difficulties with managing the various methods of carbon calculations, for example, death for a pound spent for conversion factors versus any others um, across the supply chain or internally? So I think you just mentioned there about deviating from the SBTI, but is, is there any, um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a good that's a good question. I think I often reflect on how, you know, financial accounting has been around for, what, I don't know, four, 400 years, maybe longer than that. And common accounting in earnest has been around for about 20 years. Mm. So it's still really immature. And I think it goes back to that point around when, when people say our emissions are this or our offset plan is that. You need to scratch below the surface, make sure they're using the same conversion factors uh, that, that you are. Yeah. And I guess maybe in your, you know, ITTs or, or, or whatever you're putting out, you're really clear about which standard you, you're, you're expecting people yeah. to comply with. And I think it's not any organisation worth its salt um, that is big, bidding for a contract. They should be using the latest DEFRA con um, conversion factors for, for carbon reporting. Okay. Um, there are no more questions. Um, so it just leaves it to me to say thank you so much, Simon. That has been, um, I've learned more again today. Um, I think I should set up a weekly call with you so I can learn more and more. But um, I, I should charge for this. You should. <laughs> um, but thank you so much. Uh, that was really helpful.